along a lot more quickly because today's the 13th and we're supposed to finish Beowulf today. Mm -hmm. So to go from roughly line 460 to line 3182, <laughs> not going to happen, but actually not 460, but about there. So we left off the other day, we were talking about kind of how old is Beowulf because Hrothgar says, I knew him as a boy. And then he tells us, for past favors, Beowulf has come back to kind of repay a debt. Well, the past favors were, he paid off Beowulf's father's debt. Okay? Paid the world guild for, excuse me, Edgthiel having slain Hitherleth. So my question is, did he know Beowulf when Edgthiel had to go live with Hrothgar in the long distant past? In which case, that would, that would make Beowulf, at this point, at least 45. Okay. Um, because we're going to be told later that Hrothgar ruled his kingdom for 50 years, then Grindel came. Okay. Well, when Beowulf comes, that's 12 years after Grindel came. So Hrothgar has been ruling for 62 years. He says when he took Edgethea in as a refugee, he did that when he was first in his kingship. So let's say, you know, because he's been ruling for 62 years, let's say he considers five years in as being early in his kingship. Well, that's 57 years ago. If he knew Beowulf as being a boy 57 years ago, and that doesn't mean Beowulf's 45, being a boy, let's say he's five. Okay, let's say he's one. That means he's 56 now. Okay, possibly. If, if what I'm surmising or conjecturing about when he could have known Beowulf as a boy is true, because nobody's written about it, um, interestingly enough. So, he talks about that. He talks about settling the feud. And he says, line 473, It is a sorrow to my very soul to say to any man what Grindel has done to me, humiliated Herat with his hateful thoughts. Uh, his sudden attacks, my whole troop, my warriors are decimated. Weird has swept them away into Grindel's terror. God might easily put an end to the deeds of this mad enemy. Um, that's the first time Hrothgar says anything like this. Prior to this, what have we been told about Hrothgar's thoughts regarding Grindel? Okay, what else? He said he's kind of doing a pity party. It'll never change, is what we've been told. That he wakes up every morning thinking, yesterday's going to be just like today, and tomorrow's going to be just like today. Or today's going to be just like yesterday, tomorrow's going to be just like today. He wakes up the next morning. Today's going to be just like yesterday, tomorrow's going to be just... He never thinks of any change. Now he suddenly says, God might easily put an end to the deeds of this mad enemy. Which then opens up what... Which then should open up what question? Does Rothgar believe in God? Okay, there's one question. It's not the one I was thinking of, but that's okay. He obviously does. Yeah, but like... What changed his mind? Okay, what do you mean? Uh, what gave him the idea that this might happen? Okay. That's, that's another question, not the one I was thinking of, but that's a good one. If God could easily put an end to this, why? Why don't you? I mean, it's been going on for 12 years. Men, every night, go into the hall. And every morning, they clean out what's left of the men in the hall. 
Often men have boasted, notice the next half line, drunk with beer. Boasted what? Officers over their cups of ale that they would abide in the beer hall of Brindle's attack with a rush of sword terror. The, the often, at the beginning of line 480, that oft, okay, the old English word, can be translated other ways than just often. It can be translated also always, seemingly, every night. Danes do what? Get drunk. And over their cups of ale, they say what? Oh, Frank Grindle. And they get drunk and they go in. The poet is emphasizing this idea of drunk with ale. We're going to hear it multiple times. Okay? So, they said they would abide in the beer hall. <laughs> Again, drunk with ale, over their cups of ale, abide, it's kind of like they're going to sleep in the place where there's the big giant keg. Metaphorically, I mean, it's not literary here. And what happens? Then in the morning, this meat hall was drenched with blood. When daylight gleamed, the bench is gory, the hall splattered and befouled. I had fewer dear warriors when death took them away. Okay. Yes, in terms of the totality of his warriors, he had fewer dear warriors when death took them away. But in talking about the warriors in the hall, how many fewer dear warriors did he have? He's saying they're all dead. This is Lytotis. None of the guys who vowed to take on Grindle live. Now sit down at my feast. Next half line. Drink mead in my hall. In other words, fill up, Beowulf. The reward of victory as your mood urges. And you've got a gloss down there. Now sit, da, da, da. The meaning of this line in Old English is disputed. What line is that? It's 489. Sit to nu to semna on an sal miato. Sit now to the feast. And on the seat, mead. It's got to, you know, and have at it. All right. So, they clear a bench in the beer hall for the men of the Geats altogether. In other words, a bunch of people who are already sitting on that bench have got to get up and leave. Okay. Someone brings in a, 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 a ale cup, and we're told, 496, the shop sang brightly in Herat. There was the joy of heroes. No small gathering of Danes and Gids. And then Unferth speaks. And you've got a gloss. Unferth's name, which may be significant, means either unpeace or unreason. The Un, U, N, means our modern English Un. It can also mean Mar. Like to damage something? Mar peace. Bad reason. Bad peace. Okay? In the manuscript, by the way, it is always spelled H U N. Every time Unfer's name shows up, it's capital H and it's capital. It's a big fat capital. Every time. And yet almost every edition emends it to un. Why? Because this alliterates every time. It alliterates with another vowel or other vowels in that line. The sound doesn't alliterate in every line that the name shows up. So most modern editors say the H at the beginning is a scribal error and the scribes did it every time. you got to have a lot of faith in error to think that they did that every time. I, several others, kind of think, no, it's there for a reason. Okay? Because what's the difference between un and hun? Well, this would be like 
The faith of the Huns, or the faith, or the reason of the Huns. Hun reason, right? Well, the Huns weren't necessarily <coughs> known as being all that faithful or reasonable people. We have a guy named Attila the Hun, or Attila the Hun, for which we still have ideas in our popular consciousness about him that he wasn't, you know, the nicest of people. So, Utfrith speaks, son of Edgelof. There's that name that I referred to the other day, you know. Edgedale means slave or servant of the sword. Edgelof means leavings of the edge, like the little iron filings you get after you sharpen a sword. That's not a positive name, okay? Who sits at the feet of the shielding lord, and he unbound his battle rooms, okay? So you've got the hall. It looks like this. Here's the hearth in the middle. Here's a bench. Here's the take that back. Here's Hrothgar's seat. Unfair sits at his feet. This is the fire. Beowulf is sitting here. He's surrounded on either side by Hrothgar's two sons, Frederick and Hrothwin. Okay. His wife, um, Welthael, is kind of hovering around. So we get Unferth, and he sits at Hrothgar's feet. Now, what does that usually imply? If you sit at somebody's feet, what does that make you? A beggar. A beggar? Subservient. Possibly. Subservient? You guys are thinking all the negative terms. Special? Special? It's where you learn. Oh. <laughs> like a disciple. A follower, right? Beowulf's journey, that brave seafarer, sorely vexed him. That is, Unferth, he's troubled in mind about Beowulf's journey. Why? He did not wish that any other man on this middle earth should care for glory under the heavens more than he himself. Notice, the narrator tells us this. The narrator takes us inside Unferth's mind and reveals the secret thoughts of his heart. Dirty, blasted Beowulf. He's what? He's going to get more glory under the heaven than me. And so he says, are you that Beowulf? What? Who contested with Brecca. And he talks about a swimming match. Now, if Beowulf were Jack Sparrow, what would he say? Yes, I am, but at least you've heard of me. Okay. The implication is, has Beowulf heard of any famous deeds of Unferth? No. No, nobody's told any stories of Unferth. That's not true, though. Beowulf is going to tell us some stories about Unferth. So, are you the Beowulf who strove with Brecca in a swimming contest? And he goes on, he kind of tells a version of the story. And he finishes it, 525. So I expect a worse outcome from you. Why? Because Brecko won. So I expect a worse outcome from you, though you may have survived the storm of battle. Some grim combats. Some grim combats, what did Beowulf say? Uh, I slew a tribe of giants. I captured five. I slew a bunch of sea monsters. Some, if for Grindel you dare to lie and wait the whole night long. Beowulf, what a great deal. Unferth, my friend, drunk with beer you have said about Brecca, told his adventures. What does he mean, Unferth, my friend? <laughs> okay, that's one way of looking at it. What's another modern way? Buddy. Okay, it could be. Shut up, buddy. Could be that. Bless your heart. It could, well, you're getting close. You know, it could be a southern thing. I mean, there are the South Danes, after all, that are waiting for you. <laughs> it could also be like politicians. I mean, you'll get somebody on the right or the left stand up and say, my good friend, the senator from, when you know they'd really like nothing more than to meet that friend in a back alley with a big long knife, you know, and just slice and dice him. So, what does he say? What a great deal you said, Unferth. Drunk with beer. 
the liquor has loosened your tongue. Told his adventures. So Beowulf channels Paul Harvey. If you're familiar with Paul Harvey, because what did Paul Harvey always do on the radio? Starts it, commercial, now for the rest of the story. And Beowulf gives us the rest of the story. Or the real version. You heard Brecca's version. Now let me tell you the whole story. So he says, when we were just boys, we two agreed and boasted. We were both still in our youth. Both still in our youth. That still tells me that Beowulf doesn't think of himself now as in his youth. Well, people who are 20 don't think of themselves necessarily as in their youth if their youth means 10. That we would what? That we would risk our lives out on the great ocean. Okay. Why did they do this? Because they boasted. Was this a smart thing to do? No, this is stupid. Well, who does things like this? Young, young men. <laughs> stupid young men. Hey, watch this, you know. We had bare swords when we swam in the sea, hard in our hands to protect themselves from whales. So they jump out in the ocean, swords in hand, male shirts on, because he's going to talk about the male shirt. Take my Harry Potter course in London. Go to the Tower of London, or a variety of castles, and put on a sample male shirt. They've got multiple sizes. You've got child size and adult size. Put a male shirt on if you can lift it over your head because it's about 60 pounds. And feel that just drape on your shoulders. And then imagine jumping off a cliff into the ocean. Okay, <laughs> what ocean are we talking about? We're not talking about the Bahamas or Bermuda or Virgin Islands or anywhere in the Caribbean. We're not even talking the English Channel or the Irish Sea. We're talking the Baltic where its average temperature is like 40 degrees with 60 pounds of mail on, holding probably a five pound sword. Most people are gonna do what when they jump in the ocean with a 60 pound mail shirt on? <laughs> but not Beowulf. He says, not for anything could he swim far from me on the sea waves, sea waves, nor would I go from him. They were together on the sea, what? Five nights. Swimming. They don't have floaties, you know, on their arms. They're not wearing life preservers. Until the flood, the ocean, the currents drove us apart. Surging waves, coldest of weathers, darkening night and northern wind, knife sharp, etc., etc. Seas were choppy. My coat of, offer, coat of armor offered help against the hostile ones. What did they do? They dragged him down to the ocean floor. How deep is this? Is he talking, you know, 10 feet from the shore? <laughs> so he's gone down like maybe eight feet? Or are we talking a couple hundred feet? We're not talking the Pacific. This isn't the Marianas Trench, you know, but still. They drag him down to the floor, why? because they think they're going to eat him, but he stabs the monster with the point of his sword. And he says, time and again, those terrible enemies sorely threaten me. I served them well as they deserved. A little bit of wordplay there. Served them. They thought to serve him as their meal, and he sliced and diced them. Okay? Light shone from the east, 569. God's bright beacon. The waves grew calm so that I could see the sea cliffs. The wind swept capes. Weird, this is a gnomic passage. Weird often spares an undoomed man when his courage endures. That is, when he doesn't give up. So I slew nine of the sea monsters. I've never heard of a harder night battle under heaven's vault, nor a more wretched man on the water stream. But I escaped alive. In the sea washed me up, the currents of the flood. Where? 
in the land of the Finns. Okay, so where is the land of the Finns? Today that is called Finland. Finland. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> if we had a map up here, and I did, there is a map up on the D2L under the Beowulf links. And you can see, you know, Norway comes over here, Sweden kind of comes down here, Denmark's here. Where's Finland? Way. Way up here. The nearest point of Finland to where probably Beowulf would have jumped into the ocean is about 500 miles. And how did he travel that 500 miles? Swimming. With a 60 pound metal shirt and a five pound sword in 40 degree water. What does just that tell us about Beowulf? Skip the slewing, the slaying the tribe of giants, the capturing five, the killing the water monsters. Skip all that. Just the swimming stuff. What does that tell us about Beowulf? He has a will to live. Okay, he has a will to live. Ridiculous endurance. Ridiculous endurance. His health must be amazing. Louder? His health. And His health it must be amazing. What else? Yeah, that's like the uh, capacities of like a human. Like okay. Is he really human? In other words, is this the Anglo-Saxon version of the Marvel Universe? <laughs> He's a superhero. There's no other way to describe him. He is a superhero. Okay? He's human, yes. He has a human father. Human mother, we know them both. We don't know his mother's name. We know his father's name. We know his mother's father's name. Gretel, the gate and such. Okay, But he has abilities the rest of us don't have. I don't think Beowulf is supposed to be understood as one of us. He is a type of... He stands for, represents something else, something kind of outside our normal kin or, or our normal understanding, okay? So he goes on and says, never heard a word about any such contest concerning you. <laughs> yeah, and Bre nor Brecca either. In fact, he says, Brecca has never, nor you either, done a deed so bold and daring, 585, with his decorated blade. I would never boast of it. <laughs> Though you became your brother's killer, your next of kin. Okay, remember one day I put up over here the fourfold Germanic ethic? One, duty to Lord. Two, duty to kin. Three, duty to avenge one's Lord and kin. For trust or reliance in fate or weird. Okay? Part of that duty to Lord, duty to kin means the greatest crime you could commit in Anglo Saxon slash Germanic society was to be a kinslayer. That goes at the heart of society. Guess what? It's back there in Genesis. Is there any, is it any accident? Okay? That Grendel is described as a descendant of Cain, and we get the first mention of Grendel immediately after we are told Herod will burn to the ground because of what? Family feud. Okay, in laws, still family. He now accuses Unferth of being a kinslayer. Not just a kinslayer, like his third cousin eight times removed. His closest of kin. All right? Where's Unferth sitting? At Hrothgar's feet. All right? Presumably, Unferth's been sitting there a long time. We're never told when Unferth comes to live with Hrothgar. He might be a, a, a long-standing dame for a while. He might have been there 50 years or 62 years. Okay. 
Kinslayer sitting at the feet of the king. In other words, Kinslayer sitting at the heart of the kingdom. Who comes to invade the kingdom? A descendant of the Kinslayer. Is it almost like steel, maggot? Does Unferth attract Grindel? Maybe not like that. Might Grindel serve a purpose? Maybe two lines for sure. Okay, hold that thought. So, you became your brother's killer, your next of kin. For that you needs must suffer punishment in hell, no matter how clever you are. You've got a gloss. Unfair's fratricide brings the general theme of kin slaying, represented by Grindel's descent from Cain, inside Hrothgar's hall. Yes, but it was already there, right after the hall was opened. It was implied. In reality, at least in the reality of the heroic world depicted in poetry, it may not have been unthinkable for kinsmen to find themselves on opposite sides of a battle. Loyalty to one's lord was supposed to outweigh the claims of blood relation. That's true. But even in some Germanic literature, where you find yourselves on opposite sides of a battle, the poets describe the tension between kin fighting each other as being great. There's an old English poem, excuse me, there's a fragment of an old English poem called the Valdera, W-A-L-D-E-R-E, about a man named Walter who has a son, the son gets separated from him, raised somewhere else, and they get involved in a battle together and fight each other. And only after I think it is the father kills the son does he realize this was his son. Okay. And he either dies or commits suicide. I can't remember which. But it's really bad. Why? Because he violates that ethic. So, the word hell is not in the manuscript, but it is attested by one of the early transcriptions. In their translation, Bruce Mitchell and Fred Robinson read Heala, Hall. Okay, if it's not in the manuscript, what is that? 589. What is in the manuscript? Where though? Yeah, it will draw you to where though. We're not really sure what is meant by that. It gets translated usually as hell. So he goes on. I'll say it truly, son of Edgelaf, Grendel never would have worked such terror, that gruesome beast against your lord or shames and hera, if your courage and spirit were as fierce as you yourself fancy they are. Right? Notice Beowulf understands the motive behind Unfair's words. You think you're so tough. You're not tough, otherwise Grendel wouldn't be here. But he doesn't stop there. Okay, now this whole episode that we've been seeing is an example, most scholars now think, of what's called flitting or a flit. Okay, comes from Old Norse. The word comes from Old Norse. And what does it refer to? It refers to an instance, and we see this in a lot of Old Norse stuff, where somebody comes in, makes a boast, and then kind of the king's spokesman or the tribal chieftain's spokesman Stands up and says, whoa there, buddy. Show us your credentials. Okay? And the flute is a challenge. It's designed to get the other person to kind of lay out their credentials, how they're going to do what they say they're going to do, based upon previous experience. Okay? So, if that's what this is, Unferth isn't really challenging Beowulf out of any malice. He's challenging him because this is his job. He's essentially saying, okay, so you've applied for the job of monster killer. Show me your resume. Let me see where you've killed monsters before. Oh, and you're that Beowulf who did the swimming thing, right? You know, we've heard about that. That's really bad press. You know, you, you got to prove something about that. So Beowulf what? He answers the bad press about the swimming contest. He lays out his credentials as being a monster killer. 
the kitty goes beyond the bounds of the normal flit. He makes it personal. Oh, and by the way, you killed your brother. Okay, that's a that's not part of the flitting traditional response. Okay, that's like saying your mama wears combat boots, and as a man, just doesn't go over well. So he doesn't stop there. So he's been insulting uh, Unferth. Now listen to him. He has found that he need fear no feud, no storm of swords from the victory shieldings. Grendel doesn't need to fear the feud. He doesn't need to fear a storm of swords from the, what does he call the Danes? Victory shieldings. How do they become victorious in their wars? What must they use? Swords. Notice what he's suggesting there. You guys' swords are all limp. He's suggesting something there about Danish martial prow Danish martial prowess. Now, I imagine, and maybe it's just come because I'm odd, but I imagine other Danes in the hall hear what he says and they're like, "Did he just say what I think he said?" No storm of swords from the victory shieldings. That's sarcasm. Ooh, you guys are so victorious. No resistance at all from your nation, from your people. He takes his toll, spares no one in the Danish nation, but indulges himself. Hacks and butchers and expects no battle from the Spear Danes. If your spears were worth anything, you'd have stopped them. But I, notice the juxtaposition, okay? The Spear Danes, the Victory Shieldings, the Your Nation, the Danish Nation can't lay a glove on Grindel. But I will show him what? Soon enough, the strength and courage of the geats in the door. You Danes are a bunch of pushovers. But we geats? Afterwards, let him who will go bravely to mead when the morning light of a new day, the sun clothed in glory, shines from the south on the sons of men. When I'm done with them, then we'll see who gets a beer in the morning. Is it going to be Grindel? Or is it going to be me? Then the giver of treasure was greatly pleased. Hrothgar. Mm -hmm. Hrothgar likes what Beowulf says. Now, is that because he hears everything Beowulf said as a flit? That's what it appears to be. The only other reason I could think that he likes it is that he just kind of discounts what Beowulf has said about the Danes. I, you know, he's, he's a little full of himself. He's young. Maybe compared to Hrothgar, but, you know. He had faith in his helper. Or is he pleased because Hrothgar knows if Beowulf can't kill Grendel, what's going to happen? Nobody's going to kill Grendel. And he's going to have a Grendel problem until he dies. And then once he's dead, whoever becomes king after him is going to have a Grendel problem. And the only thing that's going to stop Grindel is Grindel dying of old age. So, he recognized Beowulf's firm resolution. There's laughter. Warriors, wealthy out. Hrothgar's queen goes around. Why? She's mindful of custom. She's obeying the, the proper behavior. She bears a meat cup. And she goes walking around, takes it to people, gives it to the Lord first. To the victorious king. How victorious has Hrothgar been for the last 12 years? <laughs> so, she break, brings it to Beowulf. She greets him. She thanks God with wise words that her wish should come to pass. That she could rely on any earl for relief from those crimes. Thank you, Jesus, that finally you send me somebody who can stop Grendel. 
kind of looking at this one he can't, this one he can't, this one and this one and this one and this one. Beowulf takes the cup and speaks to her. I resolved when I sat out over the waves, sat down in my ship with my troop of soldiers, and I would entirely fulfill the wishes of your people or fall slain. Fast in the grip of my foe. I shall perform a deed of manly courage, or in this meat hall I will await the end of my days. She's like, way to go, Beowulf. You know. So, they speak strong words. Sun starts to fall, and Halfdane, line 646, knew that the wretched beast had been planning to do battle in the high building from the time they could first see the sunrise until night fell darkening over all. And as the sun gets towards the horizon, he's like, well, look at the time, time for me to go. <laughs> so he gets up and leaves. He greets Beowulf and says, 655. I've never entrusted to any man ever since I could hold and hoist a shield the great hall of the Danes, except to you now. Well, what about all the Danes who drunk with beer and said, oh, for your grindle, and stay overnight? He means he's never said. He seems to be implying Beowulf can approach the throne. Right? The other guys couldn't. Be mindful of glory. Show your mighty valor. He says, you emerge from this undertaking alive. Line 660, you will have all you desire. <clears throat> In other words, wealth beyond your imagination. So, Hrothgar and his troop of heroes leave. The protector of the shieldings. Here, you know, in this section of the poem, every time I hear Rothgar or I hear the poet say something like that, it just jars a little bit. Because how protectorish has he been the last 12 years? And we get protector of the shieldings kind of juxtaposed with, he departs the hall, the war chief wished to seek wealth, his queen's bedchamber. It's not what it reads. The Old English reads, Walda Wigfruma, the war chief, Walda, desired Welthau Sekan, Welthau to seek Queen To To Yabedan. Yab to Yabedan is not to go to her bedchamber. He sought to bed her, is what the Old English says. So, all right, Beowulf, I'm leaving you the hall. You take on Grindel while Wolfie and I are going to go have some fun. <laughs> Keep in mind, he's old. He's really old at this point. That's what the Old English says. To me, that undercuts his character. So, Beowulf takes the hall, and we're told, 669, surely the Gatish prince greatly trusted his mighty strength, the maker's favor, when he took off his iron beard, he undid his helmet, gave his decorated sword to his servant, bid him hold his battle gear. No, this is not like the stupid movie with Angelina Jolie, where Beowulf is going to fight nude. No. He's taking off his... War corslet, the one woven by Wayland the Smith. He takes off his sword. He still has on like a leather undergarment because you wear leather underneath that mail coat. Why? Because if you get punched with that mail coat, the underside of the mail is sharp and it'll hurt. Okay? So he gives the guy all this stuff. And Beowulf goes on and says, You know, I'm not going to fight him with a sword. He already said he wouldn't. So he says, we'll fight without swords. 685. And then let the wise Lord, the holy God, grant the judgment of glory to whichever hand seems proper to him. It's almost like Beowulf gets down on his knees and says, holy God, wise Lord, you decide who should win this battle. 
Now, I kind of imagine Beowulf's men sitting off to the side going, no, 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 God, make him win. Because if he doesn't win, they are what? Dessert. Because <laughs> he'd be the main course. So he lies down. The bolster took the earl's cheek. He puts his head on his nice soft pillow. And around many a bold seafarer sank to his hall rest. Okay? So they clear the tables. They push him up against the side. Door here. And they all lay down. How do they lay down? Does Beowulf lie down here? And does man all take this over here in the corner? No. We're told it's kind of like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. And they lie down, swords and shields right here, so all they have to do is reach. Okay. And what are we told Beowulf's men think? 691. None of them thought that he should thence ever again seek his own dear homeland, his tribe or the town in which he was raised. For they had heard it said that savage death had swept away far too many of the Danish folk in that white hole. They're putting their heads down to bed thinking what? They're all going to die. They're all going to die. How much faith do they have in Beowulf? Yeah, very little. They're like, okay, he wants us to come with him, but we're all going to die. But the Lord gave a web of victory to the people of the waiters, comfort and support, so that they completely overcame their enemy through one man's craft, by his own might. That, I think, is an echo of Scripture. Just as in Adam, all men died, so in Christ, all men are made alive. That is, in one man's strength. And we're told, in fact, it is a well-known truth that mighty God has ruled mankind always and forever. Okay? That's the narrator, the poet, saying that. Who's his audience? Well, whoever is listening to to this as it's being performed or as it's being written who he's thinking about. This is where the dating of the poem gets important. If it's 600 or 700 AD, then wow, this is a, a pretty strong quote unquote Christian idea for someone that early. If it's 1000 AD or if it's 850 AD and you've got Viking rage going on, then what does that mean? God's in control. This is a very Boethian idea. Boethius wrote a book called The Consolation of Philosophy in the 6th century. Early 6th century. Boethius. Okay. Boethius was a Roman and he was good friends with the Gothic emperor, Theodoric, right? Theodoric was told that Boethius was plotting against him, so he threw him in jail. Boethius wasn't plotting against him. He was entirely guiltless, but he throws him in jail for a capital crime. While in there, Boethius writes, Consolation of Philosophy. By that, he doesn't mean, you know, pick up Plato's dialogues and you'll suddenly feel better. <laughs> just, just read a little Plato and it'll all make sense. No, what he means is the consolation of philosophy is while he's in prison, he creates this fiction, the goddess philosophy comes to him and talks to him about ultimately why bad things happen to good people. And it's not because, as uh, Rabbi Kushner said, it's not because... God is weak, and because God made a rock so big he couldn't move it, the problem with evil. No. It's because humanity loosed evil in the world. But that doesn't really answer the problem of, yeah, but why do I suffer <laughs> when I didn't do anything wrong here? And what Boethius essentially does is he says, ultimately, you got to learn to take the long view. 
Well, that's really easy when you're not the one on death row marching your head up to the block to get it locked off. What do you mean by the long view? You have, down here on Earth, fortune. Fortune rules. Fortune is a creation of God, a goddess of sorts. Okay, And think of the Earth as fortune's wheel. She's just turning it. And sometimes we're up on fortune's wheel, sometimes we're going down. But behind fortune <coughs> lies fate. Fortune can't change fate. Fate can't change fortune. Okay? Behind fate, however, lies God's providence. This is God's overarching rule and control of the universe. Now, some Protestant reformers take this to mean this. Predestination. That God sets into, into motion everything that's going to occur. And chooses exactly what's going to happen, who it's going to happen to, etc. That's not what Boethius means. Boethius means by providence this idea. Foreknowledge. How is it foreknowledge? Well, for means before, right? It's the knowledge of what's going to happen before it happens. Well, how the hell can God have knowledge of what's going to happen before it even happens? God is <laughs> Who am I? <laughs> It's because of this. We'll give God eyelashes. <laughs> this is time. Here's the beginning. Here's the end of time. Where is God in time? He He's outside right. time. Okay. Boethius' whole point is shows that word intentionally. For God, time is what? It's a point. It is not a linear thing. It's what C.S. Lewis calls the eternal present. Eternal, outside of time, present. It's all now. So when the writers of the New Testament, Paul primarily, says, God, before the foundations of the earth, you know, Christ was crucified, what's that mean? In God's understanding of time, Adam and Eve, crucifixion, resurrection, second coming, it's an instant. <coughs> so, Boethius portrays all this to say, if you look at your life solely like this, what's it become? Well, it's not flat, right? <laughs> okay, I'm not going to assume your life. No, it's like this. Up and down, up and down, up and down. Sometimes it's more down. Because <laughs> Boethius, you know, he's on that downward trajectory. Right? So, we need to learn to look at it from what? Up here. Because you think of it up and down, use language that Shakespeare or other writers would use. Life's like a tapestry or a, a cloak or something. Well, if you're a cloak, if you're part of the weaving, okay, you're part of the threads, the warp and woof of the fabric, what do you not see? Or you, you know, you something like cross stitch. You don't see the big picture. Take a cross stitch. On one side, it looks how? Beautiful. Turn it around. Not so much. But if you're one of the individual threads, what can't you see? You can't see all the other threads. So, rise up outside and you go, oh, that's a beautiful picture. Rather than, I'm a Jackson Pollock painting. <laughs> Just splattered, you know, on the universe. Right? <laughs> so, Beowulf's men think, we're all Jackson Pollock paintings, you know. But Beowulf, let him decide. It is a well-known truth, Almighty God has ruled mankind always and forever. We're going to hear almost that exact same line later on. 
but it's going to be his ruled mankind as he now yet does, or is that that line? No, it's not that one. Okay, so Grendel comes. In the dark night he came creeping, the shadow goer. The men sleep. Line 710. Then from the moor in a blanket of mist, Grendel came stalking. He bore God's anger. The evil marauder meant to ensnare some of humankind in that hall. What does that mean, he bore God's anger? The old English is, Godus era bar. Godus era bear. You got to supply the he. He bore literally God's ire. How can you bear things? You can bear them on your back. You can also what? You can carry them. In other words, you can have this thing as a weight on yourself, or you can be bringing it to someone. It's the idea you suggested earlier. How might Grendel be bearing God's ire to the Danes? God's using Grendel to punish them for one third. God's using Grendel to punish the Danes. That's a possible reading. Okay, it could also be that. Because what are we told? King couldn't do what in that feud? <laughs> he can't get the upper hand. Neither can any of his descendants. So it could be he bore God's ire in his very being. What happened to Cain when he left Eden. He was marked by God. God put a mark on him. Because Cain said, hey, God, you know, people are going to get, no, they're not. I'm going to put a mark on you, and that's going to stop them from ever touching you. And that mark, it's what? Passed down. Passed down from generation to generation to generation. Okay? And it becomes the mark of the Orkneus. Orcs. It's one of the old English words used that gets defined as trolls in here, the Elvis elves, the Ertons, giants, and the Gigantes, the French word for giants, okay? So he comes in. He bore God's anger. I love that line because it's so wonderfully ambiguous. Whether he is carrying God's anger in himself, God's really pissed at Grindel, or he's carrying God's anger to the Danes because of something they've done. The Old Testament is full of what? Language of God punishing the people of Israel. Why? Because they fall away. He punishes them. They come back. They fall away. <laughs> he punishes them. They, it's like a dance. You know, it just goes on and on. Now, this might get at part of the context of the audience of the poem because you have historically in England you've got people who write about the falling away of the people of Britain from God and God brings a scourge to them one of the earliest examples a Welsh writer named Gildas in the 6th century who wrote about the English excuse me the Britons falling away from God and the scourge God brings to bring them back are the Germanic invaders. Okay? And it's Gildas, by the way, that we get our first possible reference to Arthur at Mount Badonicus, Mount Badon. Okay? After Gildas, we have another Welsh guy, Ninius, in the 8th century, talking about the same thing. We've fallen away, and what does God do? Sends a scourge to bring us back. Right around 1000 AD, we get another okay, writer 
a guy named Wolfstan, Wolfstone, who writes a sermon called the Sermo Lupi Ad Anglos, Sermon of the Wolf to the English. And it's about the Danish ravages of England caused by what? The people falling away. People not attending church, priests not knowing the Latin that they're doing the church services in, etc. And what happens as a result? God sends the Danes to make us turn back our ways. Why could the poet not do the same kind of thing with Grendel for the pagan Germanic forebears of the Danes? And why could not the poet do the same for his audience? Saying, look, you don't do what God says to do and what's going to happen. Monsters will show up in your midst. You know, a lot of people have said, what is one of the purposes of fairy tales? Why do you tell children the tale of Hansel and Gretel? It's didactic, lost in the woods. It's didactic, don't get lost in the woods. Don't disobey your parents, because what will happen? You get eaten by the wicked witch, you get eaten by the bad wolf, you bad things happen. Okay? So, Grendel comes in, and what does he do? 740. He seized it once at his first pass, a sleeping man. Slid him open suddenly. The guy's sleeping there. One of these poor two slobs. Slid him open suddenly. I think that's telling us something about Grendel's nails. We're going to be told specifically about his nails later. They're long and they're sharp. And he just kind of goes, stem to stern. Okay? Bit into his joints, drank the blood from his veins, gobbled his flesh in gobbets, and soon it completely devoured that dead man's feet and fingertips. Doesn't mean he leaves his head behind. Okay? He stepped further. So, dead, <laughs> and he goes for the second one. He's just getting warmed up. This time, however, he quickly grabbed him with evil intent and sat up against his arm. Two, it's not entirely clear who grabs who. Apparently, Grindel reaches out to Beowulf, who is lying down. The hero then grabs Grindel's arm and sits up against it. I have no idea on earth what that means. He sits up against his arm. Does he pull his arm down and somehow lean against it? Hi, I'm Beowulf. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. But what's being said there is Grindel reaches out, Beowulf reaches up, and what does Grindel immediately know? That this guy is stronger than the other one. Oops. Yeah. Not like the others. First of all, none of the others reach out and touch someone. None of the others reach out like he does. As soon as that shepherd of sins discovered that he had never met on Middle Earth in any other region of the world, another man with a greater hand grip in his heart, he was afraid for his life. It's like he touches Beowulf's hand and realizes, uh-oh. Okay, what are we told? Beowulf has what in each hand grip? The strength of 30 men, where does he get it? We're told. The poet tells us. God gave it to him. Does that imply, I'm not saying that it does, I'm asking. Does that imply when Grendel touches Beowulf's hand, like there is something sacred slash sacramental about Beowulf's hand? Does he feel the touch of God's and goes, you know, does Beowulf have like a little buzzer in his hand? <laughs> gotcha! Because he immediately thinks, I need to get away from him. And he can't. So they throw each other against the hall walls. This is like one of those wrestling contests where you can't let go. Beowulf's men wake up. What do they try to do? They try to help them. They get out their swords and spears and they poke. And it's like, bing, bing. They don't do any good. Right? Until finally, Grendel flees without an arm. Uh, let's see here. Skipping a bunch. 
8.15, the loathsome creature felt a great pain in his body, a gaping wound opened in his shoulder joint. His sinews sprang apart. His joints burst asunder. You really to ex need to experience this in order to understand it. Several years ago, 2010, January, it was a snowy January, I walked out of my garage to put something in our trash can, stepped on snow, unaware that underneath that thin layer of snow was just a sheet of ice, and did this. <laughs> and broke my fall with my arm like this. And in doing so, completely tore all the muscles around my shoulder. So my arm did this. And pain like I, I mean, nearly passed out. Got to the hospital, you know, take two aspirin, call a surgeon in the morning kind of a thing. They didn't do anything else other than, you know, wrench my arm up to take x-rays and everything, okay? And then I had partial shoulder replacement last summer. Still hurts at times. This is pain like you can't imagine. Childbirth, I would imagine, is probably, you know, about the same. So, Grendel was forced to flee, fatally wounded. Why? Because Beowulf doesn't let go of arm. Notice, who tears the arm off? Grendel does. This is his way of getting away. Okay? The wishes of the Danes, 824, 3 were entirely fulfilled in that bloody onslaught. So, Grendel goes off. Beowulf is still there. And Beowulf takes the hand and does what? Hangs it up under the roof. Right? Morning comes. And Hrothgar comes in with the other warriors. Sees what's there. And... They get on their horses to follow the trail of no. And as they come back, well, take it back. Notice line 815 following. They go to the water, and it concealed that doom that doomed one, when deprived of joys, he lay down his life in his lair in the fen. His heathen soul and hell took him. Now this is the poet saying this. The poet is telling us, Grindel goes where? To hell. Okay. Then the old retainers come back and they celebrate Beowulf's glory. That is, they start to sing songs. They talk about how there is no one better under the broad billowing sky among the shield warriors, 816 following, more worthy to rule. Though they found no fault with their own friendly lord. That's kind of like saying, yeah, but Hrothgar ain't so half bad either. He's a pretty good king. Okay. At times they let the horses race, and we're told at times the king's staying full of grand stories, that is his show, does what? He is mindful of songs, and he, remembering many old tales, does what? 870. Found other words truly bound together. That is, he finds words in his mind and binds them together. That whole thing about alliterative Germanic poetry, he does that on horseback, riding back. He creates a poem about Beowulf. And we're told that this old poem sings about Siegemund's stirring deeds, the Volsung's strife and Fitla, when Siegemund killed the dragon. Right? This is the earliest reference in Germanic literature to Siegmund killing, or Siegmund killing the dragon. That dragon figures largely in Old Norse literature, but it's all later than this. Right? Why is this important? Because he compares Beowulf to a dragon killer. Early, in the first third of the poem. Now, what are we going to have in the last third of the poem? <laughs> Beowulf is a dragon killer. Okay. So those who want to say, oh, well, the poem is clearly a mishmash of a whole bunch of little stories all woven together. If it is, the person who put them all together did a pretty damn good job. Or... Well, Tolkien argues, no, it's the work of a single author who has this idea from the outset. 
And he's going to tell the tale, Tolkien's words, of the rise and fall of a great warrior. We see his rise, the Battle of Grindel, Grindel's mother. Notice, we're not told anything that happens in the, inter in the intervening 50 years when Beowulf is a king. It's just, he rises, he becomes king, 50 years go by, dragon comes, and he falls. Why? Because all this stuff up here is unimportant. It's a nice balance, a parallel, of the rise and fall of a great warrior. Okay. The only thing I want to point out about this passage about Sigmund and Fithla is how does he kill the dragon? How does Sigmund kill the dragon? The dragon, by the way, we know from Norse literature, this is Fafnir. Okay. And we have other versions of the story where Sigmund has been told how to kill the dragon. He's been given a sword by Regan the dwarf. Okay? And he lies essentially in a trench that the dragon will crawl over. And he does this. He stabs the dragon. Okay? Fafnir dies. Sigmund drinks the blood of the dragon. And he suddenly understands the speech of birds. Where he can hear birds communicate, not, but hear the words that they are saying. Well, the dwarf wanted him to bring the blood to him so that he would have that ability. He ends up killing the dwarf. So, why is it important? Because here, it befell him, line 890, that his sword pierced the wondrous serpent, went all the way through the dragon, and what? Stood fixed in the wall. The manly iron. Freud would just go crazy with that language, you know. The manly iron penetrating the wall. Okay, So what's it do? He stabs the dragon and the sword stays stuck in the wall. Later on, Beowulf is going to fight someone. He's going to use a sword, edge, uh, un, unferth gives him. Doesn't work. Breaks. And he's going to look around and there's going to be a sword. Hanging on a wall. I think it's the same sword. <laughs> I don't have any proof. But I think it's the same sword because of the language that we get for it. So anyways, we then get line 898. Our first, what do you want to call this? I guess this is a digression. Where the poet brings up Where the poet brings up our first reference to a bad king. And the bad king is named Haramod. He shows up in other Germanic literature. He is a quintessential bad king. Okay? And the passage goes from about 898 to. Uh, 915. That's, that's more or less all about Haramod, except for one line. Well, what are we told about Haramod? Okay. Among the Jutes, 902, he was betrayed into his enemy's hands, quickly dispatched. Notice, betrayed. Who betrayed him into his enemy's hands? His people. You can only be betrayed by your own people. Your enemies can't betray you. They're doing what enemies do. Okay. What about duty to one's lord? Well, the duty to one's lord only applies what? If they bring you treasure. If your lord is following the reciprocal laws. Okay. I fight for you, you give me treasure. I fight for you, you don't give me treasure. Okay, I'll let it slide this once. <laughs> I fight for you, you don't give me treasure. Okay. No more. And then the next time, you know, take matters into your own hands. He became, he, Haramod, line 905, became a deadly burden to his own people, to all noblemen. For many a wise man had mourned in earlier times over his headstrong ways, who had looked to him for relief from affliction. Hoped that that prince's son would prosper, receive his father's rank, that has become king, rule his people. 
Horde and Fortress, a kingdom of heroes, the shielding homeland. The kinsmen of Helak became to all the race of mankind a more pleasant friend. Kinsmen of Helak. Who is that? Beowulf. Okay. Beowulf became to notice all the race of mankind a more pleasant friend. How all the race of mankind? Okay, he does kill Grindel. You could say Grindel is a plague in all mankind. Sin possessed him, not Beowulf. The him, that's referring back to Haramod. Okay? So we get, after Beowulf kills Grindel, a poet within the poet's story compares Beowulf with Sigmund, the dragon killer. Then... That poet compares him to, or then our poet compares him to Haramoth. How? It's a negative comparison. Okay? It's a negative comparison. How does it work? Well, you get compared to somebody who's really, really bad, and how does that make you look? <laughs> Even better. Okay? So, they make their way back. They get back to Hrothgar. Hrothgar, 928. For this sight, let us swiftly offer thanks to the Almighty. Much have I endured of dire grief from Grindel, but God may always work, shepherd of glory, wonder upon wonder. God could always do miracles, in other words. It was not long ago that I did not expect ever in my life to experience relief from any of my woes. Wind stained with blood, this best of houses stood dripping, gory, a widespread woe to all wise men. Da, 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 da. It was not long ago. How not long ago was it? Yesterday. It was yesterday. Okay. He gave Beowulf the hall for one night. It was yesterday morning. That Beowulf arrives. So he's saying, yesterday morning when I woke up, here's what I thought. That never in my life would I experience relief from any of my woes. Like those in around line 178 and following who never expect to see any change die and must thrust their souls in the fires and breaks. Okay? But he goes on. Now a retainer has done the very deed <coughs> through the might of God. In other words, you didn't do it all on your own, Beowulf. Well, Beowulf already said that. He said, let God decide. Okay. Now through the might of God, which we all could not contrive to do with all our cleverness. Remember, he and his counselors sat aside and thought, and tried to come up with ways. And some of them said, Hey, I got a good idea. Let's sacrifice to the devil. Yeah, he'll help us. Lo, that woman could say, Whoever, whosoever has borne such a son into the race of men, if she still lives, that the God of old was good to her in childbearing. What? Who's he talking about? Beowulf's mother. Okay. He already says he knows who she is. She married Edgethal. I knew him as a boy. Okay. So what has he just said about Beowulf's mother? Blessed are you among women. This is the Magnificat of Mary. This is a clear echo or illusion. Is he saying Beowulf is Jesus? No, he's not. It's an echo. But it is tying Beowulf in with this idea as a type. Okay? A type of Christ. Well, what does that mean, a type? All the Old Testament deliverers, like all the major people in the book of Judges, are types of Christ. Samson, Deborah, 
Samuel, even though Samuel's a prophet. You know, you go back earlier, Moses, forward, David, they're all types. Are they perfect representations? No, nope. because they're all screwed up in one way or another. Okay, They are prefigurings. They are signposts pointing to. Well, Beowulf's the same kind of thing, only he's not pointing to. He's kind of pointing back because he comes afterwards. But he's in a pagan society. Right? So, now I will cherish you, Beowulf, best of men, like a son in my heart. Well, this word, that I will cherish you like a son in my heart, gets reported to his wife. She interprets it, or it's reported to her as, he just adopted Beowulf. Well, he's got two sons. Hrothric and Hrothman, wealthy our sons. Okay. So, he goes on and says, uh, 9, and I know we've only got a couple minutes left, 9.53. Now by yourself you have done such deeds that your fame will endure always and forever. May the Almighty reward you with good as he's already done. Beowulf, you know, freely, gladly have we fought this fight, done this deed of courage, daringly, Face this unknown power. I never noticed that before. <clears throat> but the freely. I think. Is Beowulf's response to. When Hrothgar first welcomes him. And says. Now. For debts owed. I think Beowulf was saying, no, 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 no. I did this freely. I did this on my own free. I don't know you did this squat. Okay? Mm -hmm. He says, I've done this. He says, but, you know, I'm sorry. I really wanted Grendel to stay here. I wanted you to see him dead, to see that he's really dead, not mostly dead, because they have a dead arm. Doesn't mean Grendel's dead, right? No. Okay? But, he says, 967, the creator did not wish it. God didn't want you to see Grindel here. Okay? And he enabled him to leave. And he says at the end of that, pain has seized him, line 975. Pain has seized him, grabbed him tightly in its fierce grip, its baleful bonds, and there he shall abide. In what? In baleful bonds. Guilty of his crimes, the greater judgment... How the shining maker wishes to sentence him. Notice what Beowulf doesn't say. That the poet already did say. The poet said, Grendel's rotten and burning in hell. Beowulf came in, not my place. Let God judge him. Just as Beowulf said before they fought, let God be the judge. Let God decide who wins. Okay? Then the son of Edgelof was more silent in boasting words about his battle words. After the nobleman looked on the hand over the high roof, so he sees Grindel's arm and he's kind of like, damn you, Bill. You know. So they clean up the hall because there's gore, I mean, left behind. And then what do they do? They have a party. <laughs> Big party. And we're told, 10, 11. We'll stop real soon. I have never heard of a greater host who bore themselves better before their treasure giver. Those men in their glory moved to their benches, rejoiced in the feast. They took many a full meat cup, stout-hearted in the high hall. Hrothgar and Hrothulf. Hrothulf is Hrothgar's nephew. Okay. Herod within was filled with friends. No false treacheries did the people of the Shieldings plot at that time. What does at that time imply? It's gonna happen later. But it will happen at some point. Okay. And you've got a footnote. Implicit in this statement is the idea that at some later time, the people of the Shieldings did plot false treacheries from other sources in Norse material. It is possible to infer that after the death of Hrothgar, his nephew Hrothulf ruled rather than Hrothric, Hrothman's son. 
Grawlwolf is Hrethric's cousin. Okay? Many scholars assume that the story of some sort of treacherous usurpation was known to the audience. Well, duh. It'd have to be known. Otherwise, this little illusion wouldn't make any sense. Okay, we'll stop there and pick up there on whatever. Thursday. So we're getting along. Um, we'll move along a lot. I think we'll probably finish a week from today. I think. I don't promise. So, expect a quiz.